In this video, I will attempt to clean up one of the messiest teachings in martial arts. Traditional martial arts have a lot of classical teachings that make little to no sense in modern scientific terms. It's not that they involve some sort of magic that science cannot explain, it's just that some things were taught non-verbally and or documented by people who were not students. And they were not really concerned with using vocabulary that everyone understood. If their students understood what they were talking about, that was all that really mattered. But that means that now we have this legacy of mostly meaningless terminology that gets interpreted in weird and inconsistent and mystical language that really has no place in realistic training. An example is the 13 postures. It has been said that the secret to Tai Chi, the master key to the martial art, and a defining characteristic of Tai Chi is found in what is called the 13 postures but it can be very difficult to find a satisfactory explanation of what the 13 postures are or how they relate to combat and they are certainly not what they appear to be on the surface. If you research the 13 postures you will find lots of information. In fact you will find too much information. The search will take you into a rabbit warren of complexity metaphor, simile, mysticism, hyperbole, multi-dimensional interpretations, some terrible translations, and a fair bit of fertilizer. There are classical treatises that seem like the scribbled notes of some stoned undergraduate student of Milesian philosophy. There's a treatise called The Song of the Thirteen Postures, which assumes that the reader already knows what the 13 postures are and doesn't explain anything about them. It's, it's like having a driver's manual that called the Song of the Internal Combustion Engine. It doesn't tell you anything about how the car actually works. But I digress. So, first of all, the 13 postures are not postures or martial techniques or movements. This is just another example of something that has been poorly translated from Chinese, even when you are translating into Chinese. The language itself has always been ambiguous because the traditional way of learning was experiential. There was no need to explain the physics of it because, well, for one thing, most people didn't really study physics. And for another, most of the instruction was nonverbal. There is a long tradition of martial arts being taught without any explanation. You don't think, just move. Just do. Just do. And that's really useful instruction. It's one of the, the best lessons I ever uh, got was uh, the one I got every lesson. Very good. More practice. Okay. Doing it really helps you to develop the skills necessary to understand what people are talking about. But I really think it helps to know what the principles are, what you're going for before you start to train. It helps to motivate you. So the 13 postures are actually, at their core, 13 mechanical principles that create a tactical advantage in a fight. I really think that the pedagogy can benefit from having, from the very beginning, some understanding of the science involved, but to do that, we need some sort of common vocabulary, and the traditional Chinese terminology is not very helpful most of the time. We also need some sort of approach to first principles. That is, we need a context to start with. Even if the first principles get redefined later on, as happens with science and certainly with martial arts. Now, how can we explain the 13 postures to beginners. What explanations do exist tend to use obscure Chinese words and concepts 
we talk about the five elements, uh, metal, water, wood, fire, and earth, being in the legs, and the eight trigrams, heaven, earth, water, fire, thunder, mountain, lake, and wind, being in the hands. And then we take you on this long journey through ancient philosophy and poetry and cosmology and interior decorating that have nothing to do directly with martial arts and don't really help the student at all. And don't even have the courtesy to stop and say, but I digress. But I digress. Reading what is translated in Chinese about Tai Chi is like reading an engineering manual written by Chaucer, but translated by Gregory Corso. You are left trying to figure out whether or not penguin dust is something you buy at a pet store, the fallout from an exploding penguin, or something that you see happen after you see a penguin vacuum, or a penguin wash the dishes. See, a penguin dust. But I digress. When you ask, what are the 13 postures? You might get a list. Advance, retreat, look right, gaze left, central equilibrium, uh, ward off, roll back, squeeze, press, pluck, rend, elbow, and shoulder. But the meaning of those words will change depending on the context in which they are used. The teacher might be referring to a structural property, or a mechanical characteristic, or a kind of martial technique, or a method of applying that technique. They might be referring to tactics, or strategies, or attitudes. They might be referring to attributes of, or habits that are developed uh, through training, or through mental or emotional states. They might be referring to the effect that the 13 postures have on you, or they might be referring to the effect that the 13 postures have on the opponent. And when viewed in a particular context, any of those might be considered correct. What you seldom hear, if ever, is any explanation of the physics involved or a clear deconstruction of the elements that make up the whole, or an understanding of the gestalt itself, which is constructed from the many different parts, but I digress. Okay, today I want to talk to you about the 13 postures in terms of the mechanisms of self-defense, the mechanics of it. I will try to talk about each of the 13 postures and what they are and perhaps how they combine to form the gestalt that is a martial skill. When you watch what people typically call a demonstration of the 13 postures, they will demonstrate some choreography, either solo movements or partner exercises. But these movements are not the 13 postures. They are the movements we use to teach the 13 postures. They are the context within which you practice the elements. They are not themselves supposed to be martial techniques. They are supposed to be ways of practicing the 13 mechanical efficiencies that make martial techniques work. In a fight, you apply all 13 together, really. Even the five elements of the feet, all at once? Yep, eventually. All 13 should be applied at once like the harmonic overtones of a single note or a chord, right? You do them all at the same time. So, okay, let's start. Martial techniques are all about mass, velocity, and the ways that those two things change. But the combination of the mass and velocity of an object can be used to describe different characteristics. Classical physics has several different ways of describing and measuring the different ways that a moving mass can interact with another mass. There are some universal characteristics of mass which matter to martial arts, and here's what they are. Inertia. Inertia is the stubbornness of mass. Whatever 
an object is doing, it will tend to keep doing it the same way unless something else forces it to change. If it is moving at a particular speed, it will keep doing that until something else forces it to change speed. And it will maintain its shape unless something else causes it to change shape. Momentum. Momentum is the power of that stubbornness. If you multiply the mass of an opponent by the speed at which they are running toward you, you can get an idea of how much you are going to be moved when they hit you. The less you weigh, the faster you are going to fly. Or the less they weigh, the more they're going to bounce off of you. It depends. Okay. Kinetic energy will tell you how much it is going to hurt when they hit you. For this calculation, mass is half as important as it is with momentum, but the velocity is exponentially more important than it is with momentum. How much more important? Well, exponentially. Let, let's consider this example. A one-ton truck going one kilometer per hour has approximately the same momentum as a golf ball going 43,573 kilometers per hour. That's 35 times the speed of sound. But the kinetic energy of the truck is about 77 joules, while the kinetic energy of the golf ball is approximately 3,362,115 joules, or thereabouts. So which one would you rather be in front of? A truck going one kilometer per hour, or a golf ball going 35 times the speed of sound? Now, a side note, many Tai Chi fighters run into trouble because they spend almost all of their time working with momentum, and they tend to forget about kinetic energy. Now, if you have ever watched billiards, you will have seen a cue ball hit another ball so perfectly that the momentum of the cue ball gets transferred into the second ball. The cue ball stops dead, and the other ball moves at the same speed that the cue ball had been going. But if the cue ball were twice as heavy as the second ball, a similarly efficient transfer of momentum would make the second ball go twice as fast. This happens because momentum is equal to mass times velocity, and since the second ball can't get any heavier, it has to go faster. But this mass is stubborn, and it doesn't want to give all of its momentum to the lighter ball. Now, this sort of thing happens when you punch someone in the head. If you transfer the momentum of your whole body through your fist into the opponent's head, just the head, then said head will move much faster than your fist. This explains some of the unbelievable demonstrations that you sometimes see in Tai Chi classes. When you have an efficient transfer of momentum, a very small movement of a large mass causes a smaller part of the other person's body to move surprisingly quickly and causes them to lose their balance and then stumble. So it looks like all you did was this and the other person goes flying across the room. That explains some of the demonstrations, but not all. There's other stuff going on sometimes in Tai Chi demonstrations that we'll talk about in another video. But imagine if you could transfer all of that momentum of the one-ton truck going one kilometer per hour into a golf ball. If you could do that, the world would be a much more dangerous place than it is. A nudge by a truck would make the truck stop and the golf ball would go 35 times the speed of sound. It is fortunate that perfectly elastic collisions are rare in nature and that heavy objects tend to be stubborn, too stubborn 
to give all of their momentum to any tiny little object they hit. That brings us to another scientific principle, squishability, or elastic modulus. When someone pushes you, do you get squished, do you get squashed, or do you hold your shape? Now, there are three main kinds of squishiness. There is linear squishiness, there is lateral squishiness, and then there is all over squishiness, or squashable, twistable, and packable. Straight squashability is measured by a thing called the Young's modulus, or the tensile modulus. If someone tries to squash you, and you don't change shape very much, and you go right back to your original shape when they stop squashing you, then you have a pretty good, nice, high tensile modulus. Diamond has the highest tensile modulus. It is very difficult to squash a diamond because it is pre-squashed. Now, if instead of trying to squash you, someone tries to bend or break you, and you can't be bent or broken, and then you just bounce right back to your original shape when they stop trying, then you have a high shear modulus. You might think that this is a good thing, but it can make you very easy to throw around. Your arms become like handles and grips that your opponent can use to throw you around, and your very own tension becomes a lever that your opponent can use against you. Like that. You might be able to pick up a brick with two fingers, but try picking up a water balloon with two fingers, or grabbing a fresh tomato seed with chopsticks. Now, if someone tries to pack you into a ball and wrap you up in a hairnet, and they succeed, then, wow, you have a very low bulk modulus, and you are very packable. One of the most important tools in Tai Chi is, perhaps the most important, is the ability to cultivate a very strong tensile modulus, along what I call the centripetal geodesic. The centripetal geodesic is the curved path that you create through your body so that force follows the path of highest tensile modulus. Usually we talk about the path going through you into the ground. It is the least squashable path to the ground. But it can go through your own center, or to any center that is strategically suitable. The centripetal geodesic is the thing that you push with, that you strike with, that you engage your opponent's force with. It's what you twist with. It's what you balance on. And when your opponent targets you successfully, when they are right on your center, they engage that very high tensile modulus and they bounce off the ground or whatever center you happen to connect them to. And it's okay if you connect it to your center and not the ground because sometimes you want to move. If they are pushing you, then you use their push to move away and create distance. So that's why there's a difference between the ground path, as a lot of people call it, or rooting, or, and the centripetal geodesic. It's a fine point. With practice, you can develop the ability to spontaneously redirect an opponent's force into the ground without doing anything, or without applying any extra force. This is actually a natural human function that most of us have, but which we often interfere with when we panic or think too much. One of the things that martial art can do is teach us which natural instincts are helpful and which will just get in our way. But this skill, this ability to connect an opponent's force through this strong tensile modulus into the ground, would not be very useful if the opponent could just change the direction of the push and shove you around. So, sure, they can't push you, they cannot push you this way, that's fine, so they just grab you and shove you around like that. So you have to develop a very low shear modulus. That way, they bounce off you only if they are on target 
and if they are pushing in any direction other than toward your center, then they just drift off or roll off of you. If you are really, really, really good at this, then you have a very high tensile modulus, a very low shear modulus, and an extremely variable bulk modulus that you almost never have to use. There are some approaches to martial art that involve a very high bulk modulus, making that path to the ground as big and as tough as possible. This is what we call hard power, and it can be very effective. It can be very good for many, many reasons, and I highly recommend cultivating it if you can do it. So, yeah, having a really strong bulk modulus, very practical. But soft power is a martial skill that can also work very well when you are old and weak. It makes the centripetal geodesic as skinny as possible. This has been compared to a steel needle wrapped in cotton. If the opponent pushes you in one direction, they get stabbed by the needle. But if they push in any other direction, they meet no resistance at all. So that needle and its high tensile modulus is one of the 13 postures. The low shear modulus is another. Together, they produce the effect we call pang and yu. They are two sides of the same coin, and one does not function very well without the other. With them working together, we can plow right through an opponent's resistance and remain unperturbed by their efforts. This has also been compared to water supporting a boat. You support them by being like water. They roll over like a log or drift sideways, not because of anything that you do, but merely because of the nature of water. So now, let's talk about pressure. Pressure is defined as the amount of force applied per unit of surface area. You can increase pressure by increasing the force or by decreasing the surface area. So, if you decrease the surface area, area that you push or resist against, then, as the surface area approaches zero, your pressure approaches infinity. Likewise, if the opponent's force is spread out over a large surface, then their pressure decreases. If a needle is sharp enough, it cannot be stopped. A dull needle needs more kinetic energy in order to pierce a target. Now, to a fighter, pressure is a dangerous strategic and tactical variable because its application confuses the proprioception of both combatants. Changing the force and the surface area simultaneously makes it very difficult for either of you to feel what is happening. Sometimes we might think that increasing the surface area gives us more control, but that is really like hitting a bullet with the broadside of a barn. The pressure and control that we think we feel is actually force that we are receiving. It's not what we are dishing out. Focused pressure is effortless, which makes it very difficult to feel. It is a real challenge for students to learn that easy is better, and that when you feel the force that you are applying, that's because it is being applied back to you. See, Newton's third law will not be contested here, but you can arrange it so that the equal and opposite reaction happens when you're no longer around. I can push the wall and I can feel myself pushing the wall. What I'm actually feeling is the wall pushing me. Or I can apply the force and the opposite reaction happens when I'm not there. The sharpness of your needle at that point where your opponent's force intersects your centripetal geodesic. That is another one of the 13 postures. It's called ji, or cramming. And there are movements and poses and techniques, sometimes named after it, which is uh, sometimes used to demonstrate and or to teach this quality. We teach this 
focusing this idea, this energy on a single point, with a single point of contact, learning how to make your pressure as sharp as possible. And just because we call the movement G doesn't mean that that's what we're doing. So I can do this, but I'm actually not being very sharp right here. If I do this, now I'm doing G. Now I'm focusing my effort on a single point. But if I do this, now I'm covering a big wide area and anybody could push on me anywhere and move me around. That's very different from doing this. So I could be practicing G in any posture I like, as long as I'm focusing everything on a single point. So just because the movement is called G doesn't mean the person doing it is demonstrating or practicing G or cramming the sharp needle. Now, the dullness of your opponent's needle or your ability to diffuse their force over a larger surface area, that is another one of the 13 postures, and that is called an, or press. Uh, think of it like a wine press, which takes a grape and increases its surface area. So, the first four postures are actually four ways to influence linear momentum. They keep you in control of your own mass and let you manipulate the opponent in straight lines. So, to review, the first four of the 13 postures are 1. The centripetal geodesic, a spontaneous alignment of the opponent's force with the path of highest tensile modulus through your body. 2. A low shear modulus at the point where the opponent's force intersects that centripetal geodesic of yours. In other words, no resistance against sideways pressure. 3 is increasing the pressure you can apply by decreasing the surface area that you connect with. And four, decreasing the opponent's pressure by increasing the surface area that they connect with. And increasing that surface area, by the way, can be done over time. So you can create an arc and so on that diffuses their energy. So however you diffuse their pressure is still an. So these all deal with linear momentum, and they are referred to as the four directions, traditionally called pang, yu, ji, and an. And when it comes to angular velocity or angular momentum, tai chi has the four corners, traditionally called zai, lie, zhou, and kao. Now zai, lie, zhou, and kao are usually translated as uh, pluck or pull down, it's not Really, uh, rend, elbow, and shoulder. Because there are martial techniques with these names, and these techniques are used as examples of the four corners. They're used as examples of the ways to apply these four, post four ideas, these four mechanical efficiencies. So Tsai and Lie are concerned with torque. If you try to close a door, you can do it with less movement if you push near the hinge than if you push near the doorknob. But it requires more force. If you apply the force farther from the hinge, it requires less force, but you have to push farther. Likewise, if you try to push me around, you can either use more force close to the center of rotation, or less force farther away from the center of rotation. Now, let's say that you apply force to my arm close to my center. If I can move your force away from my center, you might think that you could generate torque more easily. But in so doing, I also decrease the angle of your force and direct your force away from my center. and. I increase the arc length. You might start pushing here at a right angle, but as I extend and move your arm out there, the angle changes. That weakens the torque, and it also means that you have to go farther to have the same result. Here, I can turn this like that, and I run out of force out here. But if you can move the other person's arm farther away, then the angle is already at a weak position, and they can only move you that far if they can move you at all. 
The reduction of the angle reduces the torque and increases the, tor the arc length. It means you have to travel farther for a weaker result. Now, increasing the distance of your force from my center is what we call splitting, or lié. Traditionally, the, the, word, the Chinese word is lié. Sometimes it's done by extending the arm, like uh, lengthening the spokes of a wheel. And sometimes it's simply a matter of changing the shapes of the arms so that the opponent's force is redirected away from you like uh, the wake of a boat, as the boat splits the water. That's split, like that. So, yeah, it can be done like this, or like this, or like this. There are many different, any, well, anyway, anytime you move the, the, the arm or the point of contact farther from your body, that's lié. Now, let's say your opponent is turning their own body and using torque to apply force with their hands or their fist. If you can increase the distance between their hand and their center, then they will need more torque to generate the same amount of force. Try pushing something sideways with your hand close to your body, and then try pushing it the same thing with your hand extended straight out to your side. It takes more effort to generate the amount of force that you want at the point of contact. So causing the opponent's force to move away from their own center is called tsai, tsai or which means pluck or gather. Um, it's like taking a fruit from a tree. You are taking the opponent's force away from their center. It can also draw the opponent's center away from the earth. Either way, you're developing the radius, you're increasing the radius on one side or the other. Tsai and lié are ways of dealing with someone who tries to grab or twist or otherwise manipulate your centripetal geodesic. They like they're trying to grab the needle. But what if the opponent wants to make the needle collapse? or to get past it, or break it, or bend it. They're trying to disassemble your centripetal geodesic. If they disconnect your centripetal geodesic in a way that prevents you from connecting their force to the ground, in a martial art this is often called trapping. They might trap your arm against your body in a way that prevents you from properly engaging the power from the earth. This is what happens when we do Joe. Uh, there can be some confusion about Joe. Joe translates often as elbow, and there is a technique called Joe, or many of them, which involves striking with the elbow. But when you strike with the elbow, what you are doing is getting past the opponent's power. You're getting past the end of the needle, you know, like this. You get past it, like that. And this way you're striking against their center, either from the inside or, or from the side. Okay. But I've, I, you know, I trick you by going like this, so now you're fighting against my fingertips and your own hand. Right? So, so I managed to creep my way up, and now you're fighting against that, and now I'm in. Okay. Right? So we're here, like this, and I'll just go like that, and now I've got this. You're getting past their power by bypassing the tip of the needle. If they don't adapt, then they literally won't have a leg to stand on. They won't be connected to the ground. Now, what if someone does that to you? Well, the first answer is always, well, don't let them. But there are two commonly useful answers. One is that you can sometimes use lié to move them away from your center and regain the distance that you've lost to point the tip at them. Another is to use kao. Kao is often translated as a shoulder stroke. A better translation uh, would be so against or abutting. I call it shortening the needle. If the opponent gets past the end of your centripetal geodesic, then you let the needle break. You let it, let it go. Remember that low shear modulus, that you 
Okay, let go of that long arm and sharpen what is left of the needle. And just keep letting it get shorter and shorter and shorter and sharper and sharper and sharper. So even if they are pushing on your torso or your hip or your legs, you connect to them from a single point of engagement and connect that to the ground. So no matter how close they get to you, they are still facing the sharp end of the needle. As long as you are willing to relax and change shape, the actual shape is not as important as the connection itself. Self-defense often depends on your ability to avoid dangerous attachments to a particular definition of self. Too many people fall down a flight of stairs because they were not willing to let go of the boxes they were carrying. Let the boxes fall instead of you. So, now we have the first eight of the 13 postures. The first four are called the four directions and deal with linear momentum and pressure. The high tensile modulus connecting to the center with a low shear modulus uh, that focuses your own force while diffusing the opponent's force. That's the four directions. The second four are called the four corners and they deal with angular momentum and torque. So increasing the distance of the opponent's force from your center of rotation and from their center of rotation while collapsing their connection to the center and preserving your connection to the ground under any circumstances. These eight are called the eight trigrams in the hands. They limit the role of the arms to regulating alignment, aim, and reach. The arms should not be used to apply force because they cannot do so without decreasing the mechanical advantage. All of the joints in the arm are class three levers, which have a negative mechanical advantage, and using them to generate force will break the centripetal geodesic and complicate the vectors beyond the mind's ability to coordinate them. It would be like juggling 16 balls instead of three. Which brings us to the legs. To understand the reasoning, uh, imagine that you are shoveling snow. If the snow is light and fluffy, like all Hollywood snow, you can shovel it with your arms and your back muscles. But if it is wet snow, or frozen formerly wet snow, left at the end of your driveway by the plow wake, then those class three levers in your arms are not going to work very well. When the snow is wet and very heavy, now you're going to have to lock your arms into place in the strongest structural alignment and use your legs to turn your whole body into a class one lever, pry that snow into the air, carry it to the side of the driveway, and then just roll it off the shovel. Uh, here's another example. This wood is too heavy for me to lift using my arm muscles. Each class three lever one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Each class three lever makes the attempt more futile. But if I use my legs and my hips, then I can increase my mechanical advantage and toss it into the air using class one levers. That's the theory anyway. The legs move the body in six degrees of freedom. Surge, heave, sway, pitch, yaw, and roll. The arms can add to that, but we don't want to use them in a way that interferes with the force and leverage of the legs. Therefore, it is said that the power is generated in the legs, is directed by the waist, and expressed in the hands. Do not try to generate power with the hands. In the 13 postures theory, there are five things that can be done with the legs. 
These are traditionally referred to as advance, retreat, look right, gaze left, and central equilibrium. Well, that is not very helpful. <laughs> Instead, let's call them regulate force, regulate space, class two lever, class one lever, and axis of rotation. Advance is better translated as apply force, a variable force. The legs, by controlling the six degrees of freedom, can increase or decrease the amount of force that you apply via the arms and the rest of the body to the opponent. But this can be in any direction. It doesn't have to be forward. It can be in more than one direction at a time, depending on your position relative to the opponent or opponents. You don't have to be moving forward to increase forward pressure. For example, a boxer can knock an opponent out with a left punch while moving backwards. Retreat is better translated as create space. The legs can create more space between you and your opponent in a way that gives you a mechanical advantage. You can do this by moving the body in any direction that creates more room. If your arms are trapped and you can't push with the arms, then you move the body. And the legs take you away from that point of contact and you create more space. Central equilibrium refers to the fact that the legs determine the axis of rotation. The most common choices for an axis of rotation are the left and right vertical axes that correspond to the hips or the axillary lines, or the central axis right through the core, uh, or the horizontal axis of the hips or the waist. Now, for most students, 99% of the time will be spent on exercising these choices. One, two, mostly the sides and the hips and the waist and the central axis. Most of the time will be spent on those. But over time, you will discover some very interesting variations, including uh, diagonal axes and very centric axes and uh, even really neat interactions with external axes. The axis of rotation could be here, it could be here, it could be both at the same time, it could be the central axis, it could be a diagonal, or it could be somewhere between you and the opponent, or it could be outside entirely so that the axis of rotation that matters is somewhere out there. And then pivot around this point. Let your whole body move around. There. This is still, let the body move around. And let your whole body move around this point. Yeah, drop the elbow. But use this or this. That's it. If I try to move this as the still point, that's gonna be one thing. But if I keep this still and I pivot around it, I've got that. If I keep this still and I pivot around it, I've got that. And that's what I'm doing when I do that. Right? Now, look right is better translated as class two lever. If your right leg is forward and you pivot clockwise around the right hip, so the entire body moves around that right hip, then it's a, it's a bit like looking around a corner. And this is also the kind of movement of techniques like ward off or pung or right back fist or some other punches, which function as class two levers with the load between the fulcrum and the effort. So the load is in the middle.
gaze left is better translated as a class one lever. If your right leg is forward and you pivot counterclockwise around the right hip, it is a bit like uh, turning away from the wall to gaze off into the distance. Okay, so you have look right, looking around the corner, and then gaze left. This is found in movements like a right cross, or a right hook, or repulse the monkey, or high pat on horse, which have the fulcrum between the load and the effort. At some point, you will likely ask, why can't you look left and gaze right? Well, the answer, of course, is that you can. But traditional Tai Chi is very right-handed. The traditional Yang style long form, the long routine, typically does grasping the bird's tail on the right side 13 times and never on the left. When asked why he didn't teach it on the other side, one revered teacher said, do you write with both hands? Now myself, I teach symmetrical routines. These are the foundation routines that I teach. So the, the Yang style foundation routine does all of the movements on both sides, all of the sequences joined together on both sides. And the Chen style foundation routine that I teach also does things on both sides. I think that the focus on right-handed techniques might have been rooted in cultural traditions that go back to the days before toilet paper and hand soap. Many cultures all over the world have long had aversions to anything left-handed. Or perhaps there's a school of thought that tries to keep the dominant hand forward, where the strong hand, the powerful hand, is in front all the time. I don't know. But for me, Teaching both sides equally is a given, uh, at least in my school. So those are the five elements in the feet. Force, space, axis of rotation, class one lever, and class two lever. All of these can be applied simultaneously. A class two lever with one leg, a class one lever with the other, increasing force while increasing space. You can also do all of these while diffusing the opponent's pressure, focusing your own tensile geodesic, increasing the subjective force radius and, and the objective force radius, and breaking the opponent's connection to the ground while preserving your own at all costs. So basically all of the 13 postures, these 13 mechanical efficiencies, can be applied simultaneously. Some will say all the time but it's sort of like singing harmonic overtones. Sometimes certain elements are more apparent than others. So the 13 postures are actually 13 mechanical efficiencies that can be applied in thousands of different ways. When you are learning Tai Chi, you'll learn routines and forms that have these archetypal movements that represent each of the 13 postures. And so you'll do a movement called ward off, which is a way of training that centripetal geodesic, that, that path of maximum tensile strength through the body. And you'll practice rolling, turning, so allowing things to go to the side. And you'll practice focusing, making the pressure very narrow and very smooth. And you'll practice diffusing the opponent's force so that it gets spread out over a wider area and time frame as well. And there are movements where you practice increasing the subjective force radius, moving the force farther away from your center. And there will be movements where you practice increasing the objective force radius, where you are drawing the other person out of their center, increasing the distance of the force, where, it's inter where it interacts, from their center. So 
you have movements that specifically do that. So we have a movement called uh, single whip, which is all about splitting. It's about increasing that force radius for yourself. And then we have pluck and pull down and raise hands and so on. We have these movements which are used to draw the opponent's force away from their central axis. So increasing the objective force radius. Then later you just start merging them all together and sometimes you forget that they are there. Then you have two-person exercises where you practice the 13 postures and you start to feel, okay, this is Pang, this is Liu, this is Ji, this is that. You start to feel each of the elements individually, but then they merge and they become one. So you end up finding out what gives you a mechanical advantage, what doesn't, and you start to develop these as, as habits, as natural as balancing on a bicycle. They become something that you are. So the goal should not be just to apply them to individual techniques, but to make them spontaneous and natural so that the mechanical advantage is your default position. This way, you will always have the strongest position and each fight, if you're unfortunate enough to get into one, each fight will start with you winning, even if you never start the fight. So the best way to win a fight is to start by winning and keep winning. And that is what the 13 postures are all about. Every school, every teacher will have a different approach. They come at it from different directions. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't all climb the mountain from the same place. And my view and my attitude towards these things has changed a lot over the years. And lately, everything has been changing with the teaching in, in mind. Everything is now focused on the pedagogy. How can I get my students to learn this faster? How can I motivate them? How can I streamline the training so that they can actually understand what they are doing and uh, develop this in the most efficient way possible? I'm often very critical of surrendering to the traditional terminology to just repeating the stuff and then expecting the students to be able to understand eventually. If you practice long enough, if you do this long enough, eventually you'll know what these words mean. So I'm, I'm very careful to try to use words that my students can understand. It doesn't always work. And sometimes I find myself slipping up and using words like qi or jing or shen or peng jing or, and I start using, uh, words that I sort of grew up with. These are the slang of my childhood in, in, tai chi, in martial arts. But then there are times when there is no clear scientific terminology to explain some of these things. Sometimes the only way to teach it is through poetry. Sometimes it's only through metaphor. And I, I, I try to use good, clear analogies whenever I can. I, I am the analogy Jesus. <laughs> sometimes I slip up, and sometimes I start using things that uh, only my students can understand, and they can only understand if I'm working with them when it's hands-on. That's part of the nature of teaching martial arts. And one of the things that happens is I talk about changing your mass or recruiting mass, and so. Uh, we talk about momentum and kinetic energy and torque, and a lot of that has to do with uh, moments of inertia, and these are calculations of mass and velocity. But a martial art is not, does not happen within a closed system, and most formulas that we deal with happen within closed systems. So every once in a while, I start talking about centrifugal force because I'm changing reference frames so often that I talk about things that you would not normally talk about in a, in a typical science class. And I also talk about changing your mass. So you can't change the velocity, but you can change the mass. Of course, you can't really change how much mass there is in the body. You change the designation of what the body is. You redefine your own frame of reference. Classical mechanics would talk about the coefficients of friction and the shear modulus, but Tai Chi talks about following, joining, sticking, and adhering. Um, 
or we could say something about merging reference frames or, or talk about it in ways that, that really screws with any attempt to find a mathematical explanation. There's no formula when you talk about it that way. You're mixing paradigms. So here's the problem. While there is no actual magic involved in Tai Chi, in martial arts, and mathematicians might be able eventually to explain what is happening, the mathematics is not practical when it comes to actually making it happen. No mathematician can keep up with the changing reference frames. I can become one with the earth beneath my opponent's feet much more quickly than I can calculate the coefficients of friction under four different axes of rotation. If Newton himself were confronted with a calculation, I bet he would say, oh, uh, divine providence. And uh, if Clark Maxwell saw it, he'd say, I, I used my chi, dude. Except he might say it with a Scottish accent. But I don't know. Now I'm digressing. If you feel like donating or contributing to the website, please feel free to do so. And you can also book a lesson, if you like, at sinclairinternalarts.com. Otherwise, very good. More practice.